Today, we have Zach Bell, co-founder of MyPlace.co, a social network to share your place and assets with your friends. Zach shares his story of raising six million from Freestyle Capital and how he built a bond with his investors and how the company came about from a side hustle while trying to solve his own problem of renting his place, but only to trusted friends. This isn't our typical founder on the podcast, and I'm excited to share Zach's story with you. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Fundraising Demystified. Today, we have Zach Bell, founder of MyPlace.co. Zach, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me, Jason. Awesome. Well, you know, Zach, looking at your background, you know, you're a serial entrepreneur, you're currently working on MyPlace.co, which you've raised in total of $6 million. Can you just give the audience a little bit of background on who you are and, you know, what led you to starting MyPlace? Um, so my name is Zach Bell. I love long walks on the beach and sunsets. Um, <laughs> but for real, no, I, um, I have been building community my entire life and I have been traveling around the world, uh, fostering that community for most of my life. And, um, I, um, kind of have my friends live all over the place. And I, you know, I wrote a blog not too long ago, kind of trying to tie this all together called I could never afford my lifestyle. And I realized that hosting friends and staying with friends and sharing my house with my friends and having my friends share their houses back with me radically defined my life and what I had access to. So I was building a company called Habitas, which uh, I encourage you to look up. It's a really beautiful uh, hotel brand all over the world that uh, we call it luxury for the soul. So it's all about redefining luxury around um, you know, connection with yourself, connection with nature and connection with other people. Luxury isn't like the built environment and extreme isolation. So while we were building that, I was traveling around the world running marketing and my places were empty always. So I made a Squarespace page and I put my house on it uh, and I, I framed a Google calendar into it and a form and I gave the password to a couple friends and I said, let me know if you want to come stay. This is what I pay for it. If you can cover my rent, great. If not, don't worry about it. I just love it to get used. That is how this thing took over my life. Be careful what you make on a Squarespace page in a weekend. <laughs> Did it go viral? Did, uh, did did the password go out? It didn't go viral, but it was like, you know, one friend was like, hey, can I add my place? My friend was like, my cousin's looking for a place to stay. Can I give him the password? I just kept track of everyone with the password, who I gave the password to in Airtable. And it ended up with like 2,500 people um, and a bunch of houses, mostly in New York, LA, and San Francisco, which is where we were all living at the time, kind of in L and, uh, and, you know, skipping ahead a lot of things, but like the New York Times wrote an article they like included us in a listicle about alternatives to Airbnb. And I had written on the homepage, like share with your friends. And all these people reached out and were like, I also want to share my house, but not with your friends. I would like to share my house with my own friends. And turns out that product is really complex to build, uh, but we're getting there. Um, and we've had some, some early successes with it. That's fascinating. So, you know, kind of serendipity, you know, in terms of just you put something out to solve your own problem and everyone got excited about it and started to to leverage the platform as well and kind of get overwhelmed and i've seen a lot of co home sharing types of businesses obviously there's like launch houses with more of like a accelerator type experience um you know for a specific crowd and then i've seen like entrepreneur houses but you know this looks more of just a sense of community it doesn't necessarily matter what your background is um i guess where where are you guys at with the business now um, we just kick quietly came out of beta. We haven't really loudly done anything ever. Um, but we were a while for a while we were invite only. Um, and now we're just letting anyone download the app or sign up on the website. And the way the thing that really worked, my co-founder kind of came up with the idea. We were like, do people need to friend each other? How do you define who people's friends are? So for a while we were having people send friend requests back and forth. But we ended up just adopting kind of the like the WhatsApp strategy. So when you download the app, we search your contact list and we just show you places to stay based on people that you know. Um, so it's your friends or friends of friends. And because of kind of the influence in certain communities around the world of our beta community, we ended up with um, you know, uh, you know 20 million contacts in the database. So the chances are your friends are here, um, like in, in certain networks. And so what we're slowly doing is working through getting new networks online so that when people come, their friends are already here. Um, 
so it's uh, anyone can join the platform, but you can only share your house with your friends. And then we take your network out one degree if you want, but nothing more than that. So it's friends or friends of friends. And you can always restrict people and become more private, uh, but you can't become like public. We're not a public rental site where we don't even consider ourselves a short-term rental platform. We consider ourselves more of a social network. Interesting. And that's an interesting way to look at it. And I guess from a you know business model perspective, how do you guys make money or plan to make money? Well, we don't right now, which is a really exciting time to be in 2023 <laughs> with as much sarcasm as possible. Um, but, um, you know, we think, sh you know, a lot of our investors, I'll, I'll answer it a couple of ways, but a lot of our investors believe that, and I believe that kind of sharing things with friends is just something that's never been put on the internet well yet, but it's something that happens all over the internet, WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, Facebook groups, like all these like endless amounts of groups where you're really just trying to share things with friends that you don't want to rent to strangers. Now, most people's homes are not available for short-term rental to internet strangers. Um, most of them, almost 99% of them. So uh, we're for the other people who don't want to like rent, start a business. Like an Airbnb is pretty much a business for most people. So we don't want people who start a business. We want people who just want to stay with friends, host friends for free, swap, trade, or at least cover. A lot of our users like travel for two months out of the air and just want to get their cost covered in New York. So we don't want to make money on the transaction um, because we're not a short-term rental site. So likely uh, very soon, we'll, uh, in unclear which order, but we'll introduce a platform fee. So uh, to use the social graph or to sign, share with friends of friends or t in any direction, either on the supplier or the demand side, we'll be charging a, net a small network fee. And then our most uh, requested feature is insurance. So we'll be offering... Uh, insurance but we won't be facilitating we won't be facilitating the transaction because it's hard to take a percentage of free when some and we want to continue to have people swap and trade and do free things um we don't want to be focused specifically on getting the transaction fees up well you know it's kind of like the early days of facebook don't don't monetize it until the network is you know at some kind of level of scale but uh that's and you guys consider yourselves more of the social network, which uh, you know I find interesting. A pretty interesting approach and in sharing. It's like really a so sharing assets. It's like a social marketplace. Yeah, in many uh, ways, right? we have to create in any normal marketplace. You have to create liquidity in the entire marketplace. We have to create liquidity inside of each individual user's social graph, which is the hypothesis that we're de-risking. Right, that's what we're solving for. Um, in the coming months, we'll launch a feature called groups, which we've beta tested extensively where like your business school class can join or your entire alumni group, or, you know, we're going to launch it with summit series and daybreaker and YPO for all people in trust networks can, we can jumpstart people's networks. So it's not all about just getting your individual friends on one by one. No, that's smart. Especially like those kind of higher value uh, groups like you know ypo group or things of that sort i could see yeah. that being pretty interesting actually there's a lot of mutual sharing in those groups organically but not facilitated through any kind of you know more like whatsapp and text messages and stuff exactly um, and so we're le less like a facebook social network more of a marketplace but we have a social dynamic to it so when we interact with like we, we don't want to mess with zoning and cities and things like that like we don't want to put tourists in business we don't want to turn housing into businesses we just really want to get your friends in your place and get the right people using the right places and that's different for everyone some people's there's houses on the network that are like so nice i could never afford them but i also can't even see them because they're not in my network <laughs> you know um, so it's kind of everyone's network ideally is you know suited for them that's amazing that's actually yeah pretty it's pretty clever and you know, I think it's going to be fascinating, and I know listeners here at this point are like, wait, he doesn't have revenue, it's social network, and wait, how much did he raise? And so I know this is going to be a fun fun story to go into. So you raised a million-dollar pre-seed uh, when you first launched in 2020, then a uh, $3.5 million formal equity seed round, and then you raised an additional $1.5 million note. So I guess just walk us through that journey. Like, you know, when did you decide to raise capital and why? And then kind of how did you go about raising the subsequent rounds? Well, I know this. This is probably going to come as a surprise to some people, but I was I was uh, on the process of leaving my last company, and a dear friend of mine was like, 
hey, that website that you made is really interesting. You should do something with it. And I, here's a blank check for $100,000 at really, like, he, I didn't even think of it. He was like, just make it for us. He was like, I know you're on sabbatical and I know you don't want to work right now, but make this just for us and our friends. Don't worry about making a business out of it. And he's a smart guy um, because we did an email like a million, a hundred K at a million. Um, and I didn't take it. Uh, I just drew down on the account. So I never ended up taking the entire investment. Um, but uh, that's kind of how it got started. I called uh, one of my best friends, who's now my co-founder, who run, ran an agency. I was like, do you want to get some developers on this? He was like, oh my God, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I had been working on something similar. So we just started kind of doing it um, a little bit with a very small amount of money, as little as we could spend. I was enjoying a salary. And then we attracted some early investors from some early Facebook guys. Um, um, people kind of core network builders. I have one friend built Facebook groups, another friend who built Facebook ads. They were like, yeah, sharing with friends on the, sharing things or assets with friends is just, no one's figured it out yet. If you can figure it out, it's going to be a big winner. So that got us to about a million dollars in 100K, 25K, 50K checks kind of casually raised over about a year, year and a half. And in that process, um, we moved off of a Squarespace page, obviously. Okay. Uh, we shipped real product um, and it, it started working a bit better. Um, and what was happening, and I, I can't stress how probably important this was, and everyone, my girlfriend, thought I was crazy, but I, it was a beta, closed beta. I onboarded every single user. I made you have a 10 minute call with me before you got access. Um, and one of those people uh, was Dave Samuel from Freestyle Capital. And after I onboarded him, he was like, I'm a venture capitalist and I'm going to send you a term sheet after we hang up. <laughs> just right out of the 10 minute call. And he's just like, yeah, I talked to a lot of found. I mean, and some of those calls ended up, I, now I, like I, I knew who he was. Like I had looked up, I look up people a little bit before they get in. I was like, Oh, this interesting. could be interesting. Didn't really think much about it. Um, we had met a year and a half prior, which I think this is important to, Note, um, we had met a year and a half prior during, but this case was an entirely different context. Um, and so I think one of the things that one of my advisors, uh, this guy, Rob Goldman is a brilliant uh, entrepreneur. He was like, your investors or your uh, acquirers or any of the people, you will know them already, likely. Um, and they'll be paying attention and they'll watch you do things and yeah, I kind of came across Dave's play really early in my career and then showed up again. And here's this interesting thing that he wants to use um, with some early traction that came off of a Squarespace page. So if, if the story kind of indicates like anything, it wasn't my first meeting with a venture capitalist. It was my like 50th, but I wasn't raising a seed round. I was about to raise a seed round. I was talking about like, oh, I'm thinking about raising a seed soon. Um, and I, a lot, most people did not, I talked to who are venture capitalists did not, but I didn't like do a formal seed process. I just started talking like kind of ra while raising the pre-seed, I was like, well, you know, we have this little safe right now, but we're thinking about raising a seed soon. And that resulted in mostly no's <laughs> as everyone of them, your podcast probably has yeah. said. Which isn't mean your business is a bad business or your idea is a bad idea. It just means that person. I mean, there's so many people that have interest in so many things that they just might not be interested in the thing that you're building. And it might take you having to talk to 50 or 100 people until you find one person that's interested in the thing that you're building. How did you get all those 50 meetings? Like, how did you go about getting those meetings? Um, I, I asked everyone I knew and just kind of laddered through my network. So, just, but you, so you were active. You were, you were seeking capital. You were going out there and making a little bit of money. I was like, well, I think we could just keep getting these. Little, I should just meet with venture capitalists and see what they say. Um, and yeah, you know, I like when I when I had when I when the guy gave me the 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 hundred k blank check. I sh he was like, I was like, oh, cool. Like someone just gave me fifty k. Um, let's go to people are investing in this, and I just did like twenty or like ten in person meetings in San Francisco. 
with like a really shitty Squarespace page, a deck with no designer, and everyone was like, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Like, it was like cute. They were like, that was a cute meeting with that guy. Uh, but I had like, I had nothing, um, but it was something. And I started the conversation. And I guess at that point, you're, you're putting yourself out there. You're getting feedback. The nose are in a lot of cases, some good feedback of, all right, well, whatever I'm doing is either I'm talking to the wrong person or maybe my materials or mission or whatever you're doing isn't a fit. But I guess, when did it start to click? So one, obviously, you know, the freestyle you know, VC coming in and um, coming in through a customer experience, but also having already known you is a massive qualifier in a lot of cases with these having some kind of prior relationship. But, you know, Beyond that, did they did Freestyle do the full three and a half million, or did you bring in some additional capital? Freestyle did most of the round, uh, and then we got it was twenty twenty one, so we got an overwhelming. Uh, once you have a term sheet, it, it's different now, uh, but yeah. back then, like once you had a term sheet, it's like blood in the water, right? And everyone wants to get involved, especially when you have like a, a well known venture capitalist leading it. So Haystack Capital came in and took pretty much the rest. Uh, Oceans Ventures, who just raised their second fund. Um, I met those guys. They're awesome. Um, they came in and did a little bit. And then we actually made a little bit of space for a bunch of angels. Um, yes. Predominantly because, we, and which is also what we did the safe, why we did the safe. Um, we wanted communities and influential people who would help us spread the network to have skin in the game. We actually haven't turned on our investor network for our growth strategy yet, but we plan on that being a massive lever. And see that, uh, and I'm glad you shared that just because as you know, advice for other founders, it's, you know, bringing on influential angels. And of course they usually come in later, you know, when there's the rounds established, but not always, but kind of being strategic of leveraging them, not just for the money, but for value add and, you know, kind of being able to hit their networks and you know, process from a customer perspective, it could be very valuable. There's a lot of, I would say, very successful kind of prominent entrepreneurs that I would say align with your thesis and kind of what you're doing and that kind of more communal um, uh, aspect, uh, community building. Yeah, so there's, from here, oh, good. No, there's like a different, there's like different outlooks on that. There's like as few names on the cap table as possible, and then there's the I want like I call it the opening a bar strategy. Or when you open a bar, you want like you want like a lot of interesting people to be owners of the bar because you want them to be like, hey, let's go to my bar. Um, and they all bring their friends and it just it kind of creates the the scene. So we want um that's why we opted for that strategy. I always have this fantasy of like the first thousand Instagram influencers got equity in Instagram. You know, there'd be like a thousand more billionaires, like a thousand yeah. billionaires instead of a few billionaires. Um, so well, that's smart. And um, I guess, did you guys do them all direct on the cap table or did you guys do like an SPV to consolidate them? Different strategies. Um, we never did an SPV, but when people came in and wanted to do uh, um, like syndicates and angel lists, we pushed everyone that wanted to put in small checks into that. And then some people gotcha. above a certain amount, above a certain amount, we put on the cap table. Gotcha. So okay, so yeah, you did an SPV through Angel List. Was was it an RUV that you guys managed, or is a we uh, didn't do it. Someone came in and wanted to do a syndicate on Angel List, so we were like, oh great, we have a bunch of people who want to put in small checks. Like we'll just push them all into the syndicate, and then anyone above a certain tier uh, amount, we put on the cap table ourselves because they didn't want to, to pay the carrier the fees. No, I'd say I think that's uh, a good lesson to share with with founders as you kind of start to consolidate. You know, maybe there's some amazing people you want on a cap table. They're amazing people, but coming in with a five thousand dollar check, that's not something you necessarily want to deal with on your cap table. But syndicates and SBVs are a great strategy to to do that. Um, all right, so you guys raised the the three and a half million. You did this proper seed round. You know, obviously peak of markets, a lot of you know interest and you know exciting you know momentum going on. Yeah, I guess you guys then decided to raise a one and a half million dollar safe after the fact, um, you know, a year later. Kind of what was the, the thought behind that? The thought behind that was that this might happen now. 
um, we kind of were counseled by different people that like the market might be challenging to raise money in later and we're in a good position now to raise. And so if we can put a little bit more money in, we should do it. And we did. And we did it um, freestyle, let it, Oceans followed it. So all of our existing investors kind of yes. recapped us. And, I, you know, this brings up an interesting point that I want to touch on. Um, it was 2021 when we did our seed round and all of my web three friends around me were raising like $70 million seed rounds. Uh, and we raised $3.3 million. So the reason we didn't raise a down round um, is because we didn't do the trendy thing. You know, anyone who did the trendy thing and raised these like obnoxious rounds they're getting their butts kicked right now. It's And anyone who put capital into those deals is getting their butts kicked kind of probably worse. Um, and I, I just caution that with like, I now have all of my friends who are acquaintances who are web three experts are now AI experts. Um, and raising these crazy rounds for these kind of ideas. It, if you go with the trend of the moment, Listen, I think Web3 stuff is going to be really successful. I and mean, I think there's AI stuff that's going to be wildly successful, obviously. But the trends hype so intensely. And so, uh, yeah, kudos to Freestyle, who was like, no, you're not raising a crazy round right now. You're raising a normal round because in two years, when you go to raise your Series A, that's going to also be normal. Um, and we want not the, it's the psycho stuff is almost unsustainable. Look at Clubhouse and these things like yeah. that. It is kind of like shark fin. Um, which is the biggest fear, right? Yeah. These, like, crazy growth curves just drop off instantly. So, and we've done the same with our marketing. Like we haven't spent ton, any money on marketing. Like we're just slow and steady growing. And then when we kind of hit our inflection points, we raise. Well, that's smart. And uh, I think it's, you know, you got some amazing counsel, you know, to acknowledge that you know things are looking dark ahead grab as much capital as you can you got it, it seems to be maybe on you know fair and reasonable terms and um you know so you guys have been basically well capitalized to to get to this point which you know i guess here which again fascinating you guys are you know, launching going to market you know still no revenue but have raised you know six million it's like definitely something that is very hard to see in this market. You know, I don't, I don't really see much of anything without revenue getting, you know, more than like a pre-seed, you know, angel round at this point. It, it's harder now, for sure. I mean, you have to put yourself back about a year. It was very, di it, it wasn't totally different, but it was very different. We are closing another round right now. Um, there's a, another small round right now, and it's way harder right now. Luckily, we have great investors who are supporting us and we're being led again by it. This is like whoever your lead investor is. I mean, that's your partner fully, you know, and we luckily have an amazing lead investor and freestyle capital is awesome. Um, as are some of our other investors, but freestyle capital has been in our back and they're, let us, they're helping us do another round right now and a strong lead gets you the rest of it, but it's, it's tough right now, um, but now we're ready. I mean, you have like things, I would say something that uh, I, I'll share a little bit vulnerably is like, I didn't, ex I would, I had expected to raise a series A by now, um, but the metrics we set, we hit. Like the metrics we set with our investors and our board and everybody, we hit them. They're just not financing that right now. The market isn't financing that at that. Like we found product market fit and we know how it works and it's growing and it's working and now we need to expand it. But because it didn't hit exponential scale nor or it doesn't have a little bit of revenue, they're not financing. You need massive scale, exponential or and probably a little bit of revenue. So the only reason we're doing another small round right now is just to like, do some inflection point marketing and start to put some rev, just start to put the rev, put the um, revenue drivers in the product a little bit earlier than we anticipated. But the part like insurance space, our, our users are begging for it. So it, it'll be great to get them what they want. Um, and you need to demonstrate some at this market for us to hit our next financing milestone. We need to demonstrate um, 
I mean, even some of the uh, uh, like multi-stage funds that we're talking to were like just they're like just a thousand, couple thousand dollars coming in. Like you don't need much. Just like get it. Just show us that it works, and then we're good. So that's what we're focusing on right now for the next stage. But I also caution founders: it's like the metrics you set might not work. Like the things could change um, in the market as a whole. And I think that's uh, a good note to share when you maybe set those metrics at a different time in a different market and you sit here and you do exactly as you were told to do and set to do and that should equal success. Um, you know, markets quickly shift and, you know, can kind of have to force you in a different direction. But it sounds like you've been wise in choosing a great partner um, as your lead investor. And that's what I aspire all my clients and any founder I work with to to really see their their VCs as their partners. And that's what VCs, good VCs want as well. And they're buying into your vision. They want to support you as the founder and your vision, and they're enabling you to do so um, and allowing you to get here. Um, so and now- great, great questions I was told to ask is like, how much of your fund have you deployed? How much of your fund do you reserve for follow on capital? Um, if you are, or like how often do you put follow on capital into deals? You know, um, things happen and uh, positively or negatively. And the fact that your investor being able to come in and support you when you need it or support you when you're like, or get more involved when things are going really well, it's really important. Um, you know, some of our investors, that some of our smaller investors, we went to them uh, at a different uh, at a moment when, when we were looking at different re, uh, options for capital, and they were like, "Our fund is fully deployed; like we can't do anything." Um, so that gets a little tricky um, if you don't ask that question. It's a good thing to know about if you have it in your back pocket or not. No, it's super smart to to get to know the VCs and to, especially in those first just first couple of conversations, qualify the VC on the other side as opposed to just you have money, okay, let's let's go. It's like no, like well, do you have money now and do you have money down the road for when you know shit might hit the fan, um, and or when things are scaling and you want to be able to do a round very quickly internally and not necessarily have to go do a whole new fundraising process. Because I imagine if Freestyle didn't have the reserves and you had to go out and find a lead in this market that wasn't already in bed with you in some capacity, this fundraise would be probably exponentially more difficult, if not prohibitive in a lot of ways. It would definitely look a lot different. Um, you know, having a strong lead who's got reputation in the, every, I mean, it's like, it's, this is not news to anybody, but like having a strong lead who has reputation in the market who follows on is also a really good sign. Like when you're, someone's already put capital in your business and they're going to put capital in your business again, and they're the person closest to the business, they have all the rights to look at everything that's going on. If they're continuing to invest, that's what gets stuff done, especially if they can, hey, you know what? They're like, we're taking a hard look at our portfolio as every fund is right now. And we're going to make sure this one stays alive because it's really, this one's one of the ones we're, we're narrowing it and betting deeper on this one is a strong signal to everybody else. And even to like, it's hard to underestimate, like even to me as an entrepreneur, that's a, to know that the person who's the people that are deepest with you, like really have your back. What would you say like your communication is with your investors over the last, you know, two years or so? Like, are you doing monthly updates, quarterly updates? What's your relationship on an ongoing basis with them? invested in their company and I have, I get their monthly updates and they're so good. If you can do that, I would do that. Um, I do a quarterly update. Um, okay. Quarterly updates are reasonable. Quarterly right? update usually. Um, and my major investors I talk to regularly, I have a standing every two weeks with Freestyle for the entirety. Um, and that's just like state of the state, intros, advice, what are you seeing in the market? Um, and that's been a great meeting. I, I don't know that you'll always get that um, as a founder. I don't know that you'll always get that, but if you, it's awesome. And he's in Disney, have a, they don't take board seats. So it's kind of like two, every two weeks, it cancels sometimes, but like broadly speaking, we spoke you know, every other, twice a month. 
for two years. Um, and have got and because of that have become friends and business partners and see each other socially. And we kind of kind of have like a third co-founder in a different capacity, completely different capacity. Well, see, it's like so not doing monthly updates, but you're meeting with your lead investor every other week. Like that's you know probably more powerful than just doing updates. I would uh, say more powerful for me, maybe yeah. not more powerful for them. One of the reasons I I would love to. Um, I would, you can build hype and momentum with your investor group if you're doing your updates well uh, on email regularly. Um, I, I could do better at that. But as a community builder, I just see it and I wish I was doing it more and I probably will start to do it um, once we get this next round closed. Well, yeah, you get to start activating maybe your angels as you guys go to market. And so those updates kind of help build that momentum. And uh, that was something that I've learned has been pretty powerful to keep them up to date. Because the worst thing happens is when you kind of go dark for a while. Like I've made an investment in a company that basically they were all, they were in the hype train. Everything was great. They were like too busy for updates. And then they just kind of went dark when the hype kind of dissipated. I'm like, what's, uh, what's going on? Can can I help you with anything? You know, like reaching out, like not, yeah, it's just like, all right, this, you know, it's, it puts a bad taste in the investor's mouth when you're quiet. Yeah, well, and what happens is if I, you know, when I know I need to do an update is when one investor texts me They're like, Hey, what's up? I'm like, got to sit down. Uh, <laughs> I read it. Um, but, uh, you miss, if you don't do the regular updates, you miss the opportunity to side note when things are challenging and ask for support. Because then all of a sudden you only ask for support and you weren't sharing all the good things that were happening. Well said. Um, you know, before we wrap here, I always like to ask, like, what's one mistake in your fundraising journey that you wish you can kind of go back? Now we talked about updates at this point. So we'll literally that one. one. I'm not <laughs> think of another well, one. What would be like in your fundraising journey, like what's a mistake that you wish you'd go back and change? I would ru have run a tighter. I, I want to. I I understand now the value of running a really tight process. Um, I kind of like moving quickly. Um, fundraising can suck up all of your bandwidth. Um, and at this, I mean, at a certain stage of a business, that is all you're doing. Um, but at this stage, unfortunately, no one, no CEO has the bandwidth for it. And I have to say the months that I did, didn't get to fundraise are by far away my most productive months. Um, and so put a spreadsheet together or an Airtable or a database or what, what you can collect as many intros as you can and hit them all up at the same time um, and, and, and move through the process as quickly as you can. Um, because you is you you just you can you you're going to be spending the money fun you're going to be spending the money and getting the money you know if you do it otherwise um which is not how you want to be spending the money you want to be spending the money building your company so that's uh that's something i i, I will likely take way more seriously uh, when we go to raise our not this current round but when we go to raise our series a i'll i'll focus much more on that it also like momentum builds momentum. You're having the same conversation. Your story is getting refined. You're moving quicker. Um, one yes leads to another yes, you know, and there's, it's all happening. If you have like a 10 days between meetings, it's like they can feel that. Yeah. Why didn't like when you're not the, you know, the, when you're not the like popular girl at the party, you're not, <laughs> the it's really obvious. You know, if you are, it's really obvious. So, being in market too long gets things a little stale. I can uh, can definitely attest to that. Uh, running a very back to back process where you're coming out of one investor meeting and going into the next, that energy is obvious and apparent, and it puts VCs on their edge of their seat to you know be a little bit more attentive and take the opportunity a little bit more seriously, as opposed to you know taking that meeting every so often and not really running that type process. So I can completely concur. And that's something that we try to help our clients with on a regular basis. We try to get them as many consolidated meetings in a very short period of time. Uh, and then even do roadshow just because everyone's gotten so used to doing everything over zoom and 
needs and everything like that, pushing those to be in person makes a huge impact, especially on those second meetings. I was an in-person guy my whole life, and I I don't even know how to pitch in person anymore. I'm <laughs> I, I like literally not. I'm like, wait, so I take out my laptop and like hook to the thing, and we're no, uh, never, it. yeah, never, never could never pitch in a meeting in my in my, my personal opinion. Yeah, uh, have a conversation. Yeah, if you're pulling up your deck, you're already lost in most cases. You know, uh, I will say one thing that I had, I, I talked, I, I, a bunch of my founder friends will say, uh, and I have spoken about this. If they ask for the deck before the meeting, they are not going to invest. It's all, I, I have seen this and I talked to a buddy of mine who started four companies uh, and I was like, did you send people decks before the meeting? He's like, never, they never invest. If I do that ever, they often don't even take the meeting. Like you, your deck is your dry, slidey deck that someone sees a thousand of needs to be so good. It needs to convince somebody to take a meeting. Your blurb should do that and then you should get a meeting. And if, if they don't want to meet with you, if they're like, you're sending the deck, you're just giving people information, they're likely not going to invest. It's my, you have to have a deck. I know that, but I like to send it after and I like to use slides from it to tell a story while I'm talking, but it's for me at least and for a couple of my friends it's been like a very high correlation to asking for the deck first and not actually invest zach thank you so much for for being on the show and kind of sharing your insights where's the best place for founders to learn more about you and my place um i mean finding my place on myplace.co or finding me on uh zach m bell.com z-a-c-h-m-p-e-l-l.com and there's links to everything i've done everything i'm doing everything that's going on there and then if you have an iphone go download the app share with your friends awesome well that's a communal community management growing that you've uh been doing for years well appreciate you being on the show look forward to getting this out to our audience and uh thanks again Thanks for having me, Jason. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We hope you learned something valuable. And if you did, be sure to let us know in the comments or by hitting that like button. If you were a founder looking to raise capital, be sure to check out our platform, thunder.vc, to use REI to identify which investors are most qualified to invest in your business. It's free to join. Just go to thunder.vc. Again, that is thunder.vc. And if you're new, we release new episodes every week. And if you or someone you know recently raised around and want to share your story, be sure to email me at jason at thunder.vc. That's our show, and we hope to see you next week.